Hey, David, thanks for being on the show. Hey, Jay, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. So I'm excited to talk to you because you are uh, Mr. International. You're in Australia at the moment. You're often in Hong Kong. You've got uh, businesses and operations that you do all over the world. I think it's going to be really interesting uh, for our audience. So I'm excited to dig into that. Great. Looking forward to sharing, Jay. So you've been in business for quite a while for yourself and uh, everybody along the way that has done that at some point came to that place where they said, you know what, I think I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I think I'm going to work for myself. I think I'm going to start my own thing. What was that like for you and, and how did you kind of make that decision to take that leap and take that risk? Jay, I wish I could say it was completely premeditated and calculated, but I think the reality of it is that it wasn't. Um, I started in, in, a, in the retail business working for a big retail group and that was kind of my training and foundation of learning a lot of things of how business is done and how operations are done in a business and how important you know all the different aspects of business are and um, I think I was quite lucky in that I got an opportunity to move out to Hong Kong at a quite an early age of about 25 um, to to run a branch or division of that company and I think it was only at that stage once I'd kind of left to live in a foreign country and started you know having a kind of certain amount of independence, you know, running a business or a part of a business that I started getting this itch to not have to have that, um, th that frustration of talking to people, reporting to people, having this like fire inside you to do things or try things, you know, and having to go through multiple layers to get to, to try it. Whether you fail or succeed is another story. Um, but it's just, you know, being a, that, that urge to be able to try things and do things and kind of get that creative energy out there, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people, when they start down that journey and they start doing things on their own, they run into roadblocks that they didn't anticipate uh, or things that they thought, wow, I never thought I'd have to deal with this. Um, what were some of those early roadblocks that maybe you ran into as you were trying to grow and scale your own business along the way? Yeah, I, Jay, there were so many. I, I think, um, you know, you, you obviously, whenever you start your own business or, or try something that you're passionate about, because that's normally the first place it should start, is that you really enjoy doing something or you're good at something and you want to try and make a business out of that. Um, I think, you know, one of the realities is that business is just not all roses. You can't just selectively choose what you want to do and you, you know you've got to build infrastructure around that you know from banking from sales from relationships um you know things that you might administration accounting just so many things you may not have any interest or care or desire to do or be involved in um you get sucked into that you know in a much deeper way and you've got to figure it out and become quite good at it otherwise you know you've got quite a high risk of just being taken advantage of or, or you know making mistakes that you you don't want to yeah, so, uh, you know, I think about that as it relates to a lot of people who are in business, you know, they kind of got into business be usually because they liked a particular thing. They were good at something and thought, I could sell this, I can do my own thing, I cannot have a boss. And then they realized exactly what you just said, which is they also have to do accounting and sales and marketing and back-end bookkeeping and organization and everything else that maybe doesn't directly relate to their product or service. So how did you uh, get around those things? Did you contract out that work? Did you end up hiring a team? Uh, how, how did you find what your particular strengths were and, and how you were going to focus on those? Yeah, so at the beginning, I hired people. Um, you know, uh, you know just, it's a, I suppose you grow and evolve. You know, at the beginning, you start with people who do that and they kind of help you on a part-time basis. Hopefully, as you grow, you start hiring those people full-time. I must say, at that stage, um, of my life outsourcing online through the internet or, or didn't really exist yet or so infantile at its infantile stages. Whereas now, if, if I look at how I do things now compared to then, now I try to outsource as much as possible and use, you know, outsourced workforces online and just find super good talent online. And what I find happens, what, what I really like about that actually is, is, um, although there's sometimes a lot of trial and error finding the right people is that you can work with so many different people of different skill sets and you discover so much more um, than what you would have ordinarily. If you hire one person, 
um, maybe it's a graphic designer or a marketing person. They've kind of got their way of doing things, their style of doing things, their skill set. And, you know, because you've got to pay a salary and you don't have unlimited resource for overheads, you work with them and within their scope. What I love about the new world now is that you can go online and just find people with so many talents and skills and try them for a hundred dollars. <laughs> and you know, whether it's copywriting or animation or design or just so many things you can experiment with that I think previously big companies had so much access to because of their resource and ability to pay. Whereas now you can literally go online as an entrepreneur and get any type of skill or talent on demand, just pay for what you need when you need it without incurring that constant overhead. But I think, you know, with that brings that, that skill set that any entrepreneur needs to have to be successful is you've got to actually get quite knowledgeable and, and I say knowledgeable on so many facets of business. You don't have to be the expert at it, but you've got to be knowledgeable enough to kind of direct and explain to people what you need, what you want and work with them to get the best results. Yeah, it's really interesting how that's all changed. I mean, I remember when I first started in business uh, years and years ago, I had, I had done some, uh, did, I did a lot of web development work and I did it yeah. myself plus with some other contractors. And I would constantly have firms in India reach out to me and say, hey, you should outsource your services to us. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. I don't even know how to deal with somebody international. And this was really yeah. like pre PayPal like days, pre like easy internet payment, you know, operations and everything else. And I remember like having to go to the bank and wire them money <laughs> once exactly. I finally started working with these people. And now, <laughs> you know, you can press a button and then bloop, the money's wherever you need it to be. But it's funny, the, the story about this, about outsourcing uh, just all over the world, is the first company I ever worked with when, in India to outsource some development work was yeah. they, the way they sold me on it was they told me they would do the whole project for me at no yes. cost. And then once the project yes. was done, if I was happy, they, I would pay them for it. And if I wasn't happy, they didn't have, I didn't have to pay them. So they took on all of the risk. And as a result of wow. that, they got me as a client. I mean, I, it's amazing. I would never do that, but they did. And, and for them, it worked really well. And I got comfortable with that outsourcing. But it is amazing now. I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't think about this, but with all the different websites there are online between Fiverr and Upwork. And there's a, a guy I had on this podcast actually who runs a website called onlinejobs.ph, which is a lot of Philippine. Um, yes, I've uh, heard of it. Yeah. And it's amazing like how many talented people are, there are out there in the world who need work and are happy to do work. And they're able to do it both, like you said, in a fractional basis where they just do a job and see how that goes. And if, you, if that goes really well, do a little more. And if that goes really well, maybe you have a, a, a longer relationship. Um, but, exactly. But dealing with those people, like people that you don't get to meet face to face, a lot of people might not be comfortable with that because you, you know, you don't have the same interaction as walking into a room and talking to somebody. So as you've kind of learned to develop those international relationships, I think that's going to be a big point of our conversation today, just international business. As you've developed yes. those international relationships, what are some things that you've learned along the way to help you work with people all over the world? Um, because they're in different cultures and they have different, you know, ways of doing things. Like how have you learned to get better at that? It's, it's actually a really good question because it, it is very different. And, and when you're dealing in so many different countries and cultures, you know, you start to learn that kind of what's meaningful to you is not always meaningful to them. And the way you explain things to people is not, doesn't always have the same meaning. And I think it's more so when you're crossing language cultures than just, um, you know, geographical cultural differences. Because I think if people's native language is English, that's always, I find a lot easier to communicate with them. Um, if it's not English, for example, Chinese or something else, um, there's, uh, there's a language barrier of words and terminologies you would use. And, you know, layered onto that, there's a cultural difference, you know, and, and, and it's characteristics that you just have to become familiar with. But I think what I do find the common thread in all of it is, is that people fundamentally want to do a good job. People fundamentally want you to be pleased with their work and, um, you know, and, and, and perform well, and they want recognition for it. And I, like, that just doesn't change wherever you go. So I think if you just kind of stick to, um, or at least this is how I look at it and how this works for me, if you kind of stick to a core set of values and principles, um, you're always going to be okay. And that is, you know, 
don't try and make things people do things necessarily the way you want them done. When you're talking to people, just try adapt to their tone, adapt to their pace, adapt to their style of talking. You know, I've, I've had calls with people, you know, from different countries and I talk fast and I've got this high energy and I realized quickly that I need to just bring it down a notch and talk at a slower rate. I need to close off one point, then get onto the next because that's how they want to process the info. But I think as long as you kind of encouraging people, you know, giving them, complimenting them on, on good work and being patient to explain your vision and idea. I think so often, and this is a big challenge with working with outsourced people, is especially, like I think you correctly said, Jay, if you're not sitting directly across them, um, you're talking through Skype or, you know, doing a video call, it's still a lot harder to get your vision and idea across because you've got to articulate it in words. You can't just take a piece of paper necessarily and sketch it or scroll through your screen and show them half a dozen ideas or examples of what you want. And they can't then reciprocate and share their work very quickly and rapidly. So you do, you do need to learn how to be, communicate more clearly that there's you know no lack of interpretation. And, and that takes a few iterations. You, you know, I, I always say to people like, when we're doing these jobs, I say, you know, like I've kind of got like a, like a three turnaround system. I don't expect anybody to get it right on round one and round two. I hope they're going to get it closer but around three. They need to be getting it mostly right. Or I just realized there's a communication breakdown. So, you know, I give myself three chances to try and improve myself on that communication and let them do it better. Or, or, or when I say maybe, maybe do it better is not the right word. Maybe to meet what I have in my head, you know, my expectation. And then if we can't at that stage, I sometimes say, well, maybe we just, it's too, it's in the too hard basket. And we walk away from a lot of jobs like that. I must be honest. Yeah. That's really good advice though, to kind of go, Hey, let me just check myself first here and see if I can mm. improve in the situation and just make sure that's true. I mean, I find that to be true, even with my, you know, full-time employees who are in the office every day, you know, as a leader, my job is first to check myself and go, hold on, am I providing clear information? Am I being direct enough? Do I have this outlined well enough so they actually understand what I'm talking about? Are our expectations close enough together? Exactly. That's a big deal. And actually a lot of the time you'll find that when I have conversations with people and I say, well, how did, why did you come up with that? That's not what I explained. And when they explain it back to me, I go, I can kind of see how they interpreted what I said like that. So you realize a lot of the time you are unintentionally wrong or not as clear as you thought you were. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'd love to talk specifically about China because I know you have a lot of experience there and I basically have no experience there. I've worked with yes. people all over the world, uh, the Philippines, India, all over Europe, uh, but I've never actually worked with anybody in China. Um, and so yes. I'm just curious, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk, especially uh, in the American economy about China over the last couple of years. Um, yes. And I don't want to get overly political, but I'm, I'm mostly interested in, you know, uh, how American um, businesses can work well with people in China. I've got a few friends actually who have developed products that they've worked with companies over there and that's kind of escalated over time. And now they're selling these products on Amazon and a few other places and doing really well yes. with it actually. Um, yes, so I'm, yes. I'm curious about some tips about, when you're working in China or with people in China, what are some ways to, to make sure that those relationships uh, go really well? So I've been living in China for 16 years, Jay. And, um, you know, I built most of our businesses that we've built, we've built off the backbone of having an infrastructure in China and sourcing products in China and, you know, managing the quality of our products and the production process and things like that. So I'm a massive, as Although it is, it can be challenging. Um, I still say you look at how many people are doing business in China. You can't, it's, you can't escape or ignore it. it. It needs to be done. And I think people, I think the lines are blurred a lot because I think there's political agendas like, you know, with the trade wars and tariffs and stuff and people, you know, hear what they want to hear on that front. But if you look at a lot of normal entrepreneurs and businessmen, you know, I, I myself am one of them and I've got loads of friends and, you know, customers and clients that are one of them. They've got great business relationships with the Chinese. Um, it's not without its challenges because there are communication barriers. Um, there, there is this perception that, you know, China's got this low quality and they'll take a chance on anything type of mentality. Um, 
which is partially true. But, you know, what we've learned over the years is, and that's why we exist as a business, actually, is that if you build a good relationship with a supplier, they're actually very loyal people um, and they value relationships. So if you take the time to build that relationship and nurture that relationship, they'll be very um, supportive and loyal and they'll do their best to support you. I think where the real challenge comes in is because they're such a pleasing culture, if that makes sense, um, like they never want to say no to you. It's always yes, yes, sure, no problem. It's a cultural thing that. Mm -hmm. But the side effect in business is when you're trying to, for example, develop a product or get something done, they'll never say, no, I can't do that. Or mm -hmm. you know, the requirement's too high. We can't meet those standards or we don't know what those standards are. They'll say, okay, okay. And then they'll try and you know, their intention will be the best intention ever. But you'll waste weeks, you know, getting samples and new samples and it's not right and it's not correct. And they won't, they want to save face. So they won't tell you that, oh, our factory managers left or our R&D team is actually outsourced and the guys aren't cooperating with us or we just don't know how to do it. We're going to try and hope you're happy. And yeah, so if you can break through that and really get to the nuts and bolts of who you're dealing with, what their capabilities are and not try to push the boundaries past what they're really capable of then you have like a more practical, responsible relationship. So I think that's where that cultural business divide comes in. It's a culture that's trying to please you, but you, you, you know, we want results and, and in a certain way, and it just doesn't always marry together so easily. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I've experienced some similar traits uh, when working with, with development teams in India in that yeah. they, number one, they, they, the, the culture seems to be from a communication standpoint, granted, first of all, most of them, uh, English is their second language. So they're, you know, I, I'm trying to deal with um, uh, expecting them to understand me as well as anything else. And that's not always fair, first of all. Yes. But, but yes. second of all is that they, they take things very literally. So like in yes. India, whatever you say, they want to do it exactly like that. There's not a lot of room for like, well, I know you said this, but don't you think this is a better idea? There's not a lot of that. But if you find those people, which we actually do have some great teams like that, exactly, they've really learned how to work with American teams and have done that for a long time because our expectation is, especially with my style, look, I'm kind of giving you a general direction and I want you to make it better, but they actually want it to be like, here's the precise specifications. I don't know if it's like that in China. Yeah, it, it is like that in China. And I always say the more detailed your specification the better the output or results you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. If you tell somebody, I want this in green and it comes back in green and you complain it's the wrong green, don't blame them, blame yourself because right. you didn't specify what Pantone color green it is. I always use that example because it's just a fact. Um, and, and it's interesting you, you'd say that because you know we also do a lot of development work on software in, China, in India. And um, it's not that different. You know, we talk to the guys about UI, UX experiences, about certain things like that. And it, intellectually and from a communication perspective, the Indians are super smart and super easy to talk to. But mm -hmm. I find that conversation often ends up in, okay, well, send me, send me an example of what you want. And I go, well, no, I'm kind of giving you conceptually what I want. I need you to now <laughs> interpret that and translate that into something. And, and to your point, Jay, like you hit the nail on the head when you said, you do have guys like that that are really good. And I think that's the truth of any country and any relationship. You have to work at relationships and kiss a lot of frogs until you find your princes. And it's yeah. not different in any country, even with your own internal staff. You know, you get good people, you get bad people, you get people you thought would be great, they're not great. It's just like any relationship. You've got to work with people a lot. And the more people you work with, the more people you're going to figure out who's on the same page as you on the same wavelength as you and you know delivers what you want and and that's the magic of entrepreneurship it's finding those people on your page on your wavelength that can deliver the results you want and i, don't, I think that crosses all international borders yeah i think that's really important actually because i i know a lot of people um this applies to all kind of stuff actually but even like you know we do a lot of marketing work and what i'll hear from yeah. people sometimes is they'll say well we tried google ads and they don't work and then I'm like, yeah. no, no, they do work. You just Absolutely. probably aren't doing them right. <laughs> it's, it's kind of exactly. the analogy I always give to people is I'm like, look, if, if I were to get a backhoe and take it out of my backyard and try and dig myself a pool, it would not go very well. 
Uh, but that's exactly. not because the tool's wrong. The tool's fine. I just don't know how to use the tool. And I think that that 100%. relates to, to like outsourcing um, work anywhere in the world, really, or frankly, even in the inside the United States. Like if, if you're not used to dealing with remote team members, it's hard. But even if you're not used, to, especially if you're not used to dealing with remote team members on the opposite time zone, who English is their second language. Um, exactly. And, and I think your advice is really good, which is sometimes you just got to try out some teams and go, hey, here's what I need, be as specific as possible. And at some point you decide that's not going to work. But I do think there is a time where you got to go, you know what, maybe, maybe it is me, maybe, maybe I need to press forward because I've found too um, in some of my international relationships that I, I have a problem sometimes of not being clear enough in those conversations. Yes. And especially yes. in India, they, they don't take offense, uh, at least the teams yes. that I've worked with, when you are, are really, really, really direct, where I think a lot of Americans would kind of be offended by it. They kind of appreciate the clarity. Um, they do. They they thrive nice. it. They go, no, thank you for giving us that direction. And then all they want to do is go and now do that and please you. Right. Yeah. And that's that exact thing happened actually with with one of our current larger development teams, where we were at a point where we're like, okay, we should let these people go. This is not working. Yeah. And I just got to the point. I'm like, look, guys, here's the problems. This is happening. This is happening. This is happening. We're about to destroy these client relationships because of this. And they're like. Oh, well, thanks for being that clear with us. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think we've really been this clear. I think we just kind of were complaining about it behind the scenes and not telling them exactly what the problem was. And now it's great. It's so that, true. That was years ago. Exactly. And in fact, to that point, Jay, like I find I've had recurring scenarios where we've had like people working for us and it's just been a struggled relationship, not getting the deliverables we want, them not doing things the way we want it. And I've called, you know, I've ended the relationship at some point and then all of a sudden, you know, they, they're kind of doing their handover period and they become rock stars. Like, oh, here's this, here's that, here's everything. I've got like, oh my God, but isn't that what I've just been asking you to do all along? And somehow it's like when, when, when it's kind of D-Day and people have to face a day of reckoning, I think, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's endorphins in your brain that start rushing around that these moments of clarity just start coming out. Um, but it's very true. It's interesting. So I want to get real tactical, at least for a minute. And think about, um, you know, let's say I have an idea for a product and I know that yeah. um, I've, I've seen other people develop products and have suppliers in China. Obviously, the costs uh, are significantly lower than having things developed here, but maybe I don't know where to start. Where does somebody start yeah. when they're trying to figure out what supplier to use and even where to make those contacts? It taught me through it like I'm a real layman because I am. Um, what would I need to do in that relationship to figure those things out? Sure. So there's, there's different, there's different ways to go about it and there's no hard and fast rule. I think there's, I always categorize people into two types of um, buyers or new, new entrants into the China space. The one is you've got a like, great product idea that it doesn't ex already exist that you want to have somebody do a design, draw it up and, you know, create a, technical drawing that people can visualize and understand what it is. And from there, you would go into getting a prototype made and then getting samples or finding a manufacturer. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit more. The other side of the scale is you've got a product idea. Um, it's maybe a fairly common product, but you just want to improve it or enhance it or, you know, just make it um, a, a, a better version of something that already exists in which case you don't really need to go the whole design route. And, you know, the shortcut is to go find a manufacturer for those types of products in China and then work with them and say, Hey, look, um, can you modify this and change this and add this? And they've often got, you know, people in house that can do a quick drawing for you and build a quick sample and prototype. So those are really two very different journeys the way I see them. So, I'll talk about each case to break it down. So if it's just a simple product already exists in the market, a lot of people manufacture, you just want to improve on it and make a better version of it. You know, uh, what, what, what a normal person would do is that hop online. They would go to websites like Alibaba, China sources made in China. I mean, there's loads of websites and they would start searching for manufacturers of those products, those product categories. And they would fill out what you call an RFQ form, request for quote. And they would literally fill out a form and say, this is what I'm looking for and describe it and explain it in as much detail as, as possible. And I'd send that to those manufacturers. 
And those manufacturers would literally start replying and saying, hey, we can do this or here's other products we do. And it would just be like dealing with any other supplier or vendor. You'd start having conversations by email, by Skype, by phone and start getting and start understanding what they can, how they can make it, what it's going to cost, what their lead time or turnaround time is. And maybe you're going to arrange samples. It's literally that easy these days online. The real challenges of that come in is vetting the supplier, right? Making sure because you're not on the ground in China is a legitimate supplier. Are they reliable? Are they trustworthy? Is the quality of the product going to be um, good? And that's where companies like us come in, where you could go to an outsourced partner like us and say, hey, can you help me check on my suppliers? I don't want to lose a relationship with the supplier and you, what you know what you don't want is middlemen trading in between but what you want is like your kind of own office on the ground in china helping you with it right saying look can you go visit the factory or can you have a discussion with the factory in chinese make sure we understand everything everything's clear or can you background check the suppliers see they real or can you help us coordinate and arrange samples and you know it's shorter to get them sent to the local office in china um, can you check the production when it's done can you inspect the products before they're produced can you help us um, with the payment mechanisms you know so that's really kind of how you'd start that if it's a, something a bit more complex, like maybe it's uh, you know, a new invention, a new design, something that doesn't really exist, or there's RP that you want to protect, um, like patents or just potential, maybe you don't want to share it with um, China quite yet, um, you know, then you might go to an industrial designer online, find somebody to sign an NDA with you and literally start designing the product on paper first. There's a lot of companies in the US or in Europe or and in China for that matter, that can build very detailed prototypes um, using 3D printing or other um, prototyping tools. And you can literally build working, mocking prototypes to create a proof of concept. Possibly you want to do a few iterations of that till it's right. And then at that stage, you may want to file for a patent or a trademark or something. And you may only at that stage want to get it quoted in China because one thing you've got to be aware of is the minute you start showing it to Chinese manufacturers or start talking to them, there's a risk that it's going to be at the next trade show with their version of it, their iteration <laughs> of it. So there's a lot of like, um, you know, caution you want to take in doing those things. Um, but again, it just depends on the level of complexity. So I met a guy yesterday who's invented this new product actually here in Australia and we were talking about it and he, he did a 3D printing, his own homemade job, just to try and visualize and conceptualize it. And I said, that's great. I said, now go online, find industrial designer, refine it, get it to the next level, do another 3D prototype. He said, what can you help me find manufacturers to make it? I said, definitely not. <laughs> I said, until you filed your patent, until you've got something a bit more refined, you don't want to be going to China with this yet because you, there's no way you're going to mass produce it. And, pay for inventory. So don't waste your time, refine the product, refine the concept before you're ready for mass production. Because what most people need to remember with China is they do want bigger production runs. It's a China production is a mass production space. It's not a small production space. Um, although there are companies that will produce smaller quantities of products that um, are, are a bit more common or easier to produce, it's just the price might go up or down quite substantially based on the volume you order. Um, but you know, no, very few people in China are going to take a new product idea and say, yeah, I'll make a couple of hundred of those for you and help you with the R and D and design. So it's important to be realistic, to understand what part of the journey you're on and where you're at. And that's where people like us help people develop and bring those product ideas to reality. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And it's, it's interesting. I'm working on a project. It's not specifically related, but it's more about dealing with people who don't speak your native language. My wife and I are heavily involved with a foundation that's down in Haiti, and we're working on some construction projects down there. And it would be nearly impossible, it would be impossible to deal with it if we didn't have people on the ground who have relationships with people that are there and speak the native language. Uh, because otherwise, like, I don't speak Creole. And I don't understand the yeah. dynamics of their economy and scale and labor and everything else. So just because it's one way here in America doesn't mean it's going to be like that in Haiti. Um, 
And I think that's really good advice to go, hey, maybe get your prototype right first uh, in America or in Australia or wherever you're at uh, before you take it to China when you're ready to mass produce. And, and that's what you guys do. I mean, um, you know, walk me through that a little bit. You know, Global TQM, which is your company, really helps yeah. people, um, you know, have those hands, feet, ears and language on the ground in China uh, so that you kind of become their partner. So I don't have to fly over to China to sort all that out. You can kind of handle it for me if I was that far along in the journey. Is that right? Exactly. So what, so what I did with global TQM um, is I just, you know, we existed in, in China because we had a need to be on the ground then have our own team of people on the ground because we were doing so many products out of China, dealing with so many manufacturers, having so many issues that it just makes sense to have our own team on the ground. And that worked really well. What happened over the years is it's like anything, Jay, you know, friends are friends are friends doing stuff. They oh, got a problem in China. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. Oh, I've got this great idea. What I do that. Oh, I speak today. If he's in China, that's what he does all day, every day. And then you get everybody calling you. And I started, you know, just kind of helping friends and family as favors, really, just to resolve some problems. And I realized quite quickly that actually um, we were solving problems so quickly and easily because most of it was communication issues. <laughs> just like, like they were going on for two, three weeks on something. And like, you know, one of the girls in my office would just pick up the phone, call the supplier, speak in Chinese. That kind of office and go, oh, no, 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 sort it out. They can have it tomorrow. I go, well, what was wrong? And they said, no, they didn't understand them and they were too shy. I was like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> so... You know, and I go like, like I didn't realize actually that people can struggle so much, and everything's about a factor of time and experience, right? If you 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 don't know how to do it, you, you go through the learning curve. So I eventually came up with the concept of global TQM after a few iterations. Say, so, well, how can I take what we're doing all day every day, and you know, kind of break it up into a system that you know people can buy ad hoc services or access our resource as and when they need to without paying a fortune. So, um, and, and without us being a trading company, you know, we don't want to be a trading company. You know, you, what product you want, we quote you, you buy it. We've got no interest in doing that. Um, but, and that, because I believe that the hard work actually has to come from the entrepreneur themselves. Mm. They're going to be engaged with their suppliers, every detail of the product, their business, everything. So they just need people to facilitate that and accelerate that and, you know, hopefully shorten the time. Um, and I always say to like the entrepreneurs we work with is, you know, you, if you do like a 30 day program with us, um, there's a good chance after those 30 days, you're not going to need us so much anymore because you're going to learn so much about how to do things. And that's fine. Our relationship becomes more transactional. It's, oh, I'm stuck. I need help right now. What can we do? Okay, we can help you. We can go to the factory and inspect it, or we can get involved and resolve or check some compliance details, whatever. It's very flexible in that regard. And I find that works well for people and it lets them build and nurture their relationship. You know, and it gets to a point where they start just actually doing calls with me sometimes just for advice on what to do next or where to from here because so much of the time is communication and culture issues and they want to give up because they're so frustrated. And I go, are you kidding me? I said, you think it's, the grass is greener on the other side. I said, you push through this, you fight through that problem and you move on and you get your product to market. And they go, oh, wow. I'm so glad you told me that I was ready to throw in the towel. I said, no, Business don't counseling throw in the session. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, so it's a number of things like that. And, and that's really how and why Global TQM started to say, how can we help people, you know, on that journey um, without taking on the burden of being the be all and end all of everything for them? Because at the end of the day, you know, if entrepreneurs come to us and say, look, we don't want to get involved in anything. We want you to do everything from us A to Z. I go, yeah, that's how I do it for my businesses. An entrepreneur would never do that. You have to own your relationships, your suppliers, your products, and just get people to help you along the way and save you time and money. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's interesting to me about your story as it relates to Global TQM is it's kind of like the Amazon story with their, whole, with their cloud hosting. Here's what I mean by that. You know, Amazon had yeah. to build this whole server infrastructure to support their own network. And then they realized, so wow, we're, we're really good at managing servers. We might as well sell some of this space to other people because they probably need it too. And we've kind of mastered it. And then now yes. Amazon AWS basically runs 
you know, half of the internet. And yet it really was a product of a product that they created for themselves that then they go, Hey, let's sell this to other people. And that's kind of what you've done too. It's like, Hey, I needed this yeah. thing. Then thought other people probably actually, need it too. I might as well scale it. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Like what I saw happening around us in our space was there's a lot of like third party inspection companies and quality control companies kind of popping up and doing really well. In fact, a very good friend of mine is one of them and he sold his business for a fortune. And we used to laugh and joke all the time. I'd say to him, I don't know what you're doing, wasting your time doing just inspections for other people. That's like such a boring mundane business. It's like, so, <laughs> it's so like operational. And he said, yeah, but we're doing really well. People need a service, need this, need that. So, and I, and I looked at what, what they do in these businesses and how they run. I go, wow, like I can't believe they've got a business out of that because I do that plus more all day, every day, just for our own products and our own, you know, group of companies that we, we servicing and supplying. I didn't know people would actually pay for that. I just thought that's normally how thing, you have to do things. And, but when I looked at the business model, I just thought, you know, to be another inspection company just doesn't really fulfill me. You know, so, you know, it took a two year process of going through a few iterations to see what can we do. And what I found and what I love about Global TQM is that we, we like helping entrepreneurs and we can help them at their business at different stages, you know, even up to a stage where, because we're passionate about product and business, you know, the, the operational aspect in China is just what we do well. Um, but what we realize is like with being able to help people and coach people through it and doing sourcing programs with them, we kind of go on this journey with them and we see them grow along the way. And I've had quite a few clients now where as they've been growing, you know, we've invested in their business, we've got involved in their business, we've helped them get their product into other sales channels that we know and have got access to. So, you know, it fulfills that entrepreneurial need, but at the same time, you know, it gives us that ability to monetize the business, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's just really interesting how all that kind of connects and how you're able to connect people all over the world together so that everybody is kind of focused on whatever their strengths are and, and you're able to kind of be that intermediary. I want to shift gears yeah, a little bit because we're running out of sure. time. I could talk about this stuff all day because I think it's uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> um, but sure. what I, I always like to hit on this subject on every single episode, and that is the topic of work-life balance. Now, everybody has a yes. different opinion on what that even means. I don't really even love the term, to be completely honest, but yeah. it's the, kind of the term everybody talks about. So the reason I ask this is because I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs end up in a place where they're stressed out, worn out, and ready to quit. And I always love hearing from other people who have been around for a long time in business because at some point, they've gone through highs and lows of this, and they've figured out what, at least – some things that work for them. Um, yes. Although I think it's a continual journey. So for you, number one, what does work-life balance even mean? And number two, how has that changed for you uh, through different seasons of business? That's such a good question. How much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Uh, um, it, I'll give you my personal view on it. Firstly, I think, you know, there's a difference between work and a job because I say to people, if you want to go on an entrepreneurial journey and do your own thing because you're so stressed and you want to free yourself from the nine to five and all that kind of messaging that's out there, I go, forget it because the minute you're an entrepreneur and doing your own business, you're going to be working twice as hard, <laughs> if not 10 times as hard as you are in your job. So if, if that really stresses you out, you're going to be 10 times more stressed an entrepreneur. You're going to be working 10 times harder and 10 times longer hours. So now if that still resonates with you, let's talk about being an entrepreneur. But, and then I get to the point where I say, well, we're definitely a work versus a job, right? And, and I think that's where it comes down to doing something you love and having a passion for what you're doing. Because I think a lot of people are in a job that they're doing it to earn the money, but they don't love what they're doing. And that's when it becomes stressful. If, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you're building a business that you like, although you're working 10 times harder, 10 times longer, it doesn't feel like a job and it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like you're fulfilling this desire or this kind of sense of satisfaction you need to by achieving success in it. So you pour yourself into it. And that's why it has to be something you're passionate about. So, and then once it's something you're passionate about, I think the work-life balance becomes you know, something that you have to create around you. So for me, um, 
I travel a lot and because I travel a lot, I've become really good at working, you know, online and in different time zones and things like that. So, you know, I've, I've figured out certain productivity tools I use and certain productivity tricks I use that give me my work life balance. But I love, you know, the, the age we're living in now and, and being able to be nomadic, you know, my sister just had a baby and um, I just hopped on a plane and came to Australia for two weeks because I can, I can sit mm. anywhere and work and we've got an office here and I don't need to sit in Hong Kong um, because there's a lot of things going on. I just hopped on a plane and I said, well, I'll sit here for two weeks. I'm going to go to India next week for some meetings urgently. And I'm going to come back here because I can. That for me is work-life balance. But all through those what all through those trips, I'm working every opportunity I get, but when we want to go and do something, I just switch off and walk out the door and go do what I feel like doing. That for me is work-life balance. I love that. And, and ultimately, the reason you're able to do that is because you built a team around you as well. Exactly. Because otherwise, if you just switched off and you had all these things that were 100% dependent on you, you couldn't do that. And I think having the right systems in place, having the right tools in place, having the right team in place, all those things are really ultimately what take somebody from having really just a bad job that they happen to be listed as boss of uh, to what is really a business, which does give you the flexibility you have now, which is, Hey, I'm going to go to Australia for two weeks. Um, exactly. And I think that team then, is huge. Yeah. And that's why I always say to people like master the tools you're using, because if you master the tools you're using, it liberates you and frees you. Because like I see people like just try different, you know, oh, I can't use this. This doesn't work. This is so hard. Can I do it this way? I go, but you're cocooning yourself into like a space that you can't share and collaborate and work with. And you're giving up on things that are potentially going to, you know, you know, unleash that, um, that, that bottleneck you've created and people get very frustrated doing those things. And I go, you can't, you have to master them because once you master them, um, it liberates you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're running out of time. So if I have to, if you had to think of parting advice, uh, you're talking directly to another entrepreneur or somebody that's trying to build a business and, and they're, they're wanting to build a business that lasts something that's going to make it for years to come and give them the flexibility to travel when they need to. Uh, what parting advice would you give them uh, at the end of our talk here today? So I think from day one, build a business that operationally you can run online. And not just, that doesn't just mean an online business. There's lots of other businesses that you can oversee operationally because you're using online tools, online collaboration tools and things like that. So I think um, that's, that's kind of one of my key tenants now in everything I do. I say, can I oversee most of this online? Can I collaborate and work with my team online from anywhere? If I can't, I think twice. And secondly, just make sure it's something you're passionate about and care about and you don't mind waking up every day and that being a subject of conversation because if it's not, you'll, you'll never put the time and energy in it needs and you'll get bored and you'll want to move on. So just try to find really something that you're passionate and care about and are good at and don't try to do what you're not good at. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are, that's good advice. Find a business you can run online. And really nowadays, the beauty is most businesses can be at least operationally run online. Like you said, it's just a matter of putting the right tools and systems in place. If people want to find you online, uh, where's the best place for them to go? Um, so, so, so we've got a website, it's globaltqm.com. And um, from there, there's like a button they can click to schedule a call. And if they just put in um, Jay on when they're scheduling the call, then I'll know that they're one of your listeners and I'll take the call myself. I love speaking to potential clients and entrepreneurs. Um, and if that's one advice, we do a lot of free advice on our calls. Um, you know, we try to build long-term relationships with people so that when they're ready to do anything in China, we're their first port of call. I love it. Well, if I'm uh, ever come up with an idea that I want to build uh, and produce in China, you will be my first call. So thanks for being Fantastic. on the show today. Uh, your uh, advice and input has been uh, really valuable and really interesting. Uh, definitely a topic I uh, did not know a whole lot about and feel better educated now. So I hope the audience does as well. For anybody that wants to find yeah. out more, again, go to globaltqm.com. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great call. 
Hey, I hope this video has helped you with some tips and ideas to build a business that lasts. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on the next videos that we roll out. And more importantly, for some awesome free resources, head over to our website at buildingabusinessthatlasts.com. You can get a free copy of my book there where I tell you how I have built an agency that's grown year over year for the last 20 years in a row. So go grab that, buildingabusinessthatlasts.com, and make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks. We'll see you soon.